who helps you to calculate. These finance people, they're not your, your cookie cutter accountants. These are finance people who are able to do valuation. They can value your business, can value your idea and tell you, your idea is worth X millions of shillings or even X billion of shillings. If your idea is as great as Google, it can become trillions of shillings. So, that's it. Then, <coughs> So Google is there. How do you turn these trillions of shillings to become available? So Google takes the $15 billion and converts it into 15 billion shares. Did you see that? The switch from dollars into shares. OK? And are you all with me? You convert the dollars into shares. Shares are just promises of ownership in a company, right? So type of share is called common. Let me put common down here. Common share. In this country, we talk about this common, we always call it ordinary shares. Yeah? Let's say preferred the shares are extraordinary. These are the shares that these guys at Technology Transfer Office give you an idea now, if you have 15 billion shares, what did Google do? It said, we're going to sell these shares at $1 per share. If you sold all those shares, you're going to have $15 billion. Do you see? So, but people are not going to buy the shares in one day. This, you may have to sell them over a period of no less than 10 years. Yeah? So you have $15 billion, share, 15 billion shares to sell to people over 10 to 15 years, right? Because you don't need all that 15 billion. We're saying this is the value of the company. Your idea is in your thesis or in your paper, the white paper. So <clears throat> you start selling these ones. Now Google, they didn't even start selling them at $1. They start selling at 50 cents, 0 0.5. This is like 50 shillings per share. And the people who come in early uh, were given a lot of these shares, I know I promise that when you, these shares, when we come to this point when we are going to offer the common shares in a public market, this is called public event or IPO, initial public offering. <coughs> initial public offering, then your shares will multiply by a certain fraction, or a certain, not, not fraction, it's going to multiply a certain number, so that if when you come here and if our shares has gone to a certain number of amount of money, we shall give you a lot of rewards. So the company now, since you don't have any money at the moment, you just have your enzyme in the lab. You give promises to people who have money so that they can invest in your company. So every company is built like that. Edu knowledge <coughs> and discovery and creation of new products is not funded by the government. First of all, you have to understand the government doesn't have any money to give you, to do your work. Government has zero money. The money does not come, even the US government doesn't come and give people money. As you can see, they sell the shares themselves, but you have the preferred shares. To say, all the wealthy people in town, okay? You tell them, we're going to create an asset. If, if the town doesn't have enough wealthy people, you go to other towns and they raise money. That is why these guys in finance help a lot. So every idea that comes from the university is converted into money. First of all, you say, how much is that idea worth? How many shares do we create for this idea? And how does the university benefit? <clears throat> when these shares are offered, this technology transfer organization, because the idea came from this university, you can say if it's 15 billion shares, uh, the university will get 1%, not too many, or 2%, but 1% of 15 billion is a lot of money. So imagine if Google was made here, how much money would come to the, back to the university? The university received the shares as just a bonus for producing smart people. So the university makes a lot of money. That's why if you go to Stanford University, you find it has billions and billions of because these guys of Google, they were going to school at Stanford. And imagine all the other people there in Silicon Valley, making Twitter, 
making Facebook, uh, making all these, WhatsApp, all these companies that could be found in Silicon Valley. Then, even if you're a student there, you don't need to pay school fees because the university is already extremely wealthy. Because the university helps to commercialize ideas. This process of taking an enzyme into product is known as commercialization. So, talking about products, commercialization. So, to make, make the products of university education to be commercial, it's called commercialization. Yeah? So, when Google issued these shares, 1998, 2005, 2005, so it's about seven years later, Google's share value had decreased to $100. Yeah, we are here, we have 50 cents. Now we have $100 per share. Because they have done a lot of work for over seven years. By the time they were there, they said, Google is mature to go to the public market. Already, they have built everything, and so the public can buy. Google is already generating some revenue. And so, today, this is another 10 years or so later, Google's share value is $1,200. That's like 120,000 shillings per share. Times 15 billion, you can see how many trillions of dollars that Google has today. This is why, in anywhere you go on this planet, Google will be there with you, right? They own satellites that countries can't afford in the sky. They send people even to this town. Have you seen Google here? They have come and taken pictures of the streets, and you can see Google street maps, Kakamega town. They, you, you would think that uh, if you look at Google, Google maps of Kakamega town, you will see that these guys have been here and they've taken 360 degrees pictures. Where does that money come from? Now you understand. If you have a great idea and you tell people, we'll never lost, that's the value that you create. That is precisely how it is done. So, you understood that. It requires another organization that is, sits between the university and the industry. And that is how they do it in all developed markets, including Japan. They cannot make all those cars in Japan without money. And it's not the government of Japan that finances Toyota. <laughs> the government of Japan cannot have as much money as Toyota has, or it needs to build those. And all that work <coughs> is a good relationship between a university and the people. The industries are not even built yet. The industries are in the future. Okay? So it's when, uh, Something I can use for wiping this. Now you have all that, it's because I'm going to be giving you exams and quizzes later to see where you've understood money, where it comes from, so that you don't, we don't come and see you 15 years later and you don't have money and you're well educated, yeah? And you have a big forest there that can manufacture medicine. We don't want anybody to be poor in this country because money is within us. So. I'll tell you when, when we discovered that. Let's say, doing research in the United States to find out how are these guys able to create so many products. There are so many products. There's a product for literally everything and anything in the USA. <clears throat> it's because they activate their money in the communities. Now, we raise money all the time for us, for things like, particularly for the dead. When you die, we shall raise money for you so much you won't believe. But you don't have to believe because you'll be dead. We call meetings. Now, if someone dies, what do we do? You see a WhatsApp group opens immediately. And when a WhatsApp group opens, everyone starts putting money by m -Pesa. That is because you died. But if you say now you want to translate a molecule into something that people will use, no one is going to send money, even if you do a pay bill number. <laughs> no one will send you money. So it looks like in our society, you're better off dying if you want to have money. Yeah? Isn't it upside down? Isn't it backward? <laughs> the money that we raise for the dead in a day, every week, can build big industries in this nation. So much money. And of course, 
for some other social courses like weddings, we also do a lot of fundraising. And maybe for people who get admitted to, to school, the, the village gets together, raises some money. But well, let's say, let the university lead us to raise money for the living. The most money we raise in this nation is for the dead people, for, for doing what we call the last respect or the last right. People uh, travel all the, the whole country, all your classmates. Do you know? People you have never, you have never encountered, you have never interacted for the last 20 years, maybe you're just 20 years old now, they will come to your funeral. But if you needed money, when you're in school, to translate your idea, you won't see them. Yeah, so funerals are very well attended. I have not yet understood that phenomenon. So we are looking at a social phenomenon like that and saying, why is it that we value our dead more? from financial financial perspective than our living. Almost people are choosing to die so that their relatives can have money, you know? And we shouldn't come to such a point where because money is only reasonable for the dead, then we, we think that we have to die in order for us to support our families. Yeah, because I'm a doctor, I hear this all the time. Because they say, doctor, leave me alone, let me die. This is someone who is in his 40s and he has got family, gets a disease. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And so <clears throat> let us not enjoy the dead so much because we can enjoy the life. Now, if you go to a country like Japan, nobody dies until they're 90 years because they have understood how to raise money for the living. Right. So we say that what was missing here is this technology Technology Transfer Organization, called a TTO. So, in Kenya, or let's say in the entire African continent, there is no university that has got a technology transfer organization. This is the one that helps the community surrounding the university to raise the money. And because of that shortcoming, we said, why don't we create such a technology transfer organization to help our universities uh, convert their knowledge? But what does it have? Now, because I was in the diaspora in the United States, the first thing we looked at is to see the money that people were sending to Kenya from the USA. By that time in 2005, Kenyans in the US were sending to Kenya, uh, let's say, $1.5 billion. $1.5 billion at that time was equivalent to about uh, 150 billion shillings. Now, if you looked at what that billion, that 150 billion shillings was doing in Kenya, you did not find it because the money is sent to the families to buy food, to pay for Healthcare, education. And in that time, people are sending money to, to buy food for their uh, relatives because they say, oh, we want to buy fertilizer to put in the farms, and this fertilizer is not enough. So when you look at that shamba, it doesn't look better than it was last year. This to buy farm inputs, farm inputs and consumption. I know because I send a lot of money myself, sending. But every year you have to send money for the farm, farm input. What they do, they call you and tell you, we need fertilizer. The rain has come. We need fertilizer. Before the rain, they, you have to send them money for, for the tractor. We need money to hire a tractor. So you send money for the tractor. But the next year is going to be the same. Maybe if you have two seasons, they'll continue asking money from you. And they say, what, where did you take the money you, have, you, know, you, you raised from harvesting the food that you grew last year? But it's not enough because we have a negative balance in our shambas. That money is not enough to grow anything, and of course, it is just getting lost. So all this money is lost. Okay? When money is lost, you cannot, it's, it is similar to now water coming from the mountain after the rains in the mountains. Here you have a mountain here. Let's say this is Mount Elgon or Mount Kenya. I know more about Mount Kenya. So, I don't know where 
rivers from Elgon flow, where do they go? Lake Victoria. Oh, yeah, that's a good example. I think it is usable. But if the water that flows from Mount Kenya, it flows down, 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 all the way to Indian Ocean. See, the Kenya is the Indian Ocean of the diaspora money. So when this money is flowing like this, or say water is flowing, it's very fresh. Fresh. You can drink. It's fresh for human consumption, in the, even animals. They can drink it. They can use it for cooking and all kinds of things. And you can use it for irrigation for your shambas during the dry season and do a lot of good stuff with it. As soon as it lands in the ocean, it changes. Now, because you guys are studying chemistry, you know that and biology and agriculture, you cannot use the ocean water for irrigation. You cannot even use it for drinking. You cannot use it for cooking. Yeah, the only animals that enjoy it is the fish in the ocean. Now, when that water changes, it is quite similar to the money that is sent from the diaspora and lands in the country and its value is lost totally and forever. It cannot be recovered. So that money doesn't help anything. Just like water, <clears throat> what smart people do is to create a dam. This is where civil engineers come. Civil engineers, if they build a dam for that water, the water fills to the top. Yeah? Then you have a lot of water. There's a huge volume of water there. What can that water do or what can it not do? If you build a dam there, and then here you have a turbine that is spinning. So you guys in electrical engineering, you can tell me the miracle that happens when you have a turbine and it has got a dynamo that generates electricity, yeah, that can be put in huge pylons and then is transported all over the country for industrial development. See that? Now that is just water itself. It turns out money is like water flowing from the ocean. All the money that is going through M-Pesa is exactly like that water flowing from where? The mountain. And when it is just flowing from pocket to pocket without being collected, then it doesn't help people. So, what the people in the West have not understood is this physics of money. You need a civil engineering project to stop the money. And the civil engineering project is what? It's called shares. See? Like what Google did to convert its total value of $15 billion into 15 billion shares that commensurate to the work of building a to work of building a wall for the water. This shares is the wall of money. <clears throat> and this is what, what is exciting, is that water molecule flows from the mountain, down here gets into a dam, it will eventually find itself into the ocean. So stopping the water momentarily does not stop it from where it was going. But that act of stopping the water gives it a new force that can now spur a lot of industrial development. This is exactly what is the technology of money. You stop the, you stop the money momentarily with shares of common stock, that money will still end up in the pockets of the people who provided it by buying shares. This is why when Google was here, 1998, in 2005, <coughs> The shares had multiplied 100 times, maybe 200. Now, another 10 years, the shares have multiplied thousands of times. Yeah? And so all those, the value of those shares ends back in the pocket of the people who produced the money in the beginning. See? And so we're able to raise our money. So in Kenya, we are able to build walls of money. But there's no one who is training people about this technology. How do we create shares? for ideas in a university so that those ideas can have enough finance to be brought all the way to fruition and then they can, they can be, have sufficient money for research, development, R&D, and manufacturing, and then commercialization, which is what you would say is the effect of stopping the water 
creating a whole series of new products. And then is you have electrical energy that is commercialized. See? So when we saw this, what did we do? Eh, this is sticky. I'm going to write on this side. <laughs> so the Ubrica itself. Ubrica is an acronym. First of all, U studying for Ustawi. When you're in the beginning, we're in the diaspora and you say Ustawi. Ustawi is the abbreviation for United States to Africa Wealth Initiative. United States to Africa Now this is all the way back in 2005 it comes says to study the flow of money always coming from the diaspora and we are doing this saying what if we could use this money to create a technology transfer organization or to fund university education in Kenya uh, that's a translation of knowledge from the universities to whatever so <clears throat> This technology transfer organization was now to use um, the diaspora dollars. And so by that time, it wasn't very clear. But then, said that we looked much deeper to see how Americans do this. You know, if you went to the United States, a very big country, and you see they have a lot of products. They have movies, they have cars, they have computers, they have medicines, and they have a lot, everything. But what you discover is that these things are not built in one place, all of them. Movies come from Hollywood, yeah? Cars are made in Detroit. Computers are in Silicon Valley. Medicine is in North Carolina, Triago Park. It has to choose what it wants to specialize in. So if we want to develop Kenya, now even this university itself, it cannot be all things to all people. I would strongly suggest because this university is next to a rainforest, Study pharmaceutical science and uh, technology and engineering science that is related to the tropical rainforest because this is a huge lab that's just given to Masida Muliro. It's right there. So you have to specialize. Now, Japan, for it to develop, they have to decide what do we want to do with our knowledge. Knowledge is concentrated and knowledge is very, very specific. So when Japan decided to take engineering, they went to engineering, broadly speaking, and you can see what happened to Japan. Japan is not known for making medicines. Although after many years they manufacture, but their main specialty is engineering. So they make engineering of all kinds, whether mechanical engineering. So they make a lot of cars. Then they go to electronic engineering. They go to electronics, you know, TVs and other devices, radios, and then they computer science as it relates to engineering. And so all the, their, their vehicles are computerized. So in this, in this case, we say, let's do biomedical. Biomedical, biomedical research. Mm -hmm. Then we do innovation, innovation in biomedical research. And then of course, we build the industries, this innovation in industrial centers. Then you look for centers in different locations in the nation, and then we support that type of work in Africa. Centers. So this is the, usual, the eventual outcome of the research, the investigation, like, and we create a company called Ubrica, which is an acronym for that, a commitment to biomedical scientific development, which means life science, Life science is science of biology and how to take biology to the next level and medicine. How we create the best medicine in this world and we have to create places where such things occur or we go into partnership with institutions so that biology and medicine lead us. Of course, from this, then you can see all the other uh, scientific disciplines emerging from even uh, social sciences like sociology because medicine and biology uh, determine, are determined made by social activities in the nation and then engineering from electrical engineering to civil engineering and then even to architecture design of hospitals and pharmaceuticals facilities research labs and all that stuff so 
just focusing on one area can help to develop all other areas in the nation. So long as you put enough money in that particular area, the other areas develop spontaneously. Like Japan put money on engineering and everything else in Japan developed as a result. So focusing on concentration of resources. So from here, then life science, then you can have healthcare or health itself, which means talks about clinics and hospitals. This services delivery system, clinics, hospitals, and preventive places for prim primary health care, prevention, before people got sick. Hmm. So that is Eureka project. So what did we do? And so we call this Eureka project. Now Eureka is a noun. So we created an organization that life science and health, or health production organization that can take care of these things. Let me see. So for us then, we should two billion shares because we calculated and found that for this to be, if we did this, it is going to be a two billion dollars worth project, an idea that is worth two billion dollars. So we create two billion shares and these two billion shares, <coughs> two categories, preferred stock or preferred shares in this, we created two, 20 million, and this money helps to develop the organization. This is in 2014. 2014. So here, 2014, this is to fund development of the organization, to develop the skills, and then we take it, take it, take it, take it to 2024 when you have an initial public offering where we are going to offer the rest of the shares to the general public in the United States because there's less corruption over there with these type of things through an organization known as NASDAQ. NASDAQ. And we get the organization listed. Meanwhile, we raise money for science and biomedical development in the nation and healthcare itself. So then that is 2014. When, as soon as we announce shares, these shares we are announcing at zero point five dollars per share per share, and this zero point five dollars per share is equivalent to about fifty shillings per share. But then, since that time, people started buying shares private, privately. Private investors they bought shares, bought shares, and now they and as soon as they buy shares, we keep on developing new stuff. They have come to five thousand shillings per share, which is $50, yeah. So our Ubricoin sh uh, Ubrica share today is $50. Now, I'm telling you this so you can see how ideas are financed, and you can finance them slowly from the university until you get to a point where the company or what you're creating is strong enough to be sent to the public market. This IPO means initial public offering. Okay, and so this knowledge, although it's available, it is not taught in the university, and it is tragic because now the guys in the university are expecting government to do something about it, and the money instead it's raised privately in the beginning through um, through the technology transfer office. Now, if we do Ubrica itself to specifically serve is the technology transfer organizations for our universities in Kenya then we can raise money and channel that money to uh, research and development and commercialization on, of university level ideas. Huh? So, <laughs> yeah. So when we, I, I came into Kenya in 2016 and I found there's a much more profound problem. The problem is not just in the university, but in healthcare, is that Kenyans are the, 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 the care in Kenya is so bad. The quality is so low. And of course, even when the quality is very low, people don't have money. And when they go to hospital without money, they get detained by the hospital owners. The hospital owners are not police. They should not detain anyone. But they take the liberty of detaining people. When a person is detained in a hospital, he is not fed by the hospital. 
So of course, it's like they're trying to kill you slowly. And then they don't treat the disease that brought you to the hospital. And of course, when you die, it doesn't mean that you're not going to pay that money. So your family will be left raising Harambe to pay for your, de for your death. And that is tragic. So we ask ourselves, why is it that we don't have money in Kenya to pay for medical care? We know that, of course. In Kenya, when you grow some, you know, you, you produce things in this country, you have very difficult time selling those things because there is no market for goods produced in Kenya, inside Kenya. Inside Kenya, there is no market for produce made, produced in Kenya, food produce. And so if you may go to major supermarkets, people are just distributing foods in this country, you'll find that they get foods from everywhere else from Kenya. Fruits are imported from South Africa and other countries. Honey comes from New Zealand and where? And maybe Australia. And bananas are coming from Mexico. Eggs come from Uganda. Uh, we have onions from Tanzania. We have clothes from everywhere else. So if you make something in this country, you're not likely to find someone who can buy it. Even if you make your education. You become an engineer, and then you have engineers from China building our roads. So if we continue that way, we're suddenly going to go down the economic path. We go down, and, and then we don't have our own market for things. The only market available for Kenyan produce or Kenyan goods is known as Sokomjinga. So if you have produced your stuff, then you can take them Sokomjinga. You're likely to find people to buy it. Okay? But if you try to put them in the mainstream market, you cannot fight that market. Supposing you make clothes here in, uh, you know, clothes like this, in Kakamega town, how likely is it that you find them in the big uh, clothing stores in Nairobi city? You can't. Because the people who are building the malls in Nairobi city, they would like to sell clothes that come from elsewhere. Because Kenyans seem to like clothes imported. What if you make furniture, seats like, like this? Even these ones did not come from around here. It came probably from China. So it looks like our nation has a preference for imported stuff. And if we prefer to buy imported stuff, who is going to buy the stuff that we are making? See? And when we can't not sell anything, we cannot have money. Because money, is, money comes from selling. So let no one lie to us about something called uh, the purchasing power parity. You will hear that in class of economics. Purchasing power in a nation, from, particularly from the World Bank. Purchasing power parity. This means the basket of goods that you can buy. Mm -hmm. Purchasing power parity is a completely misleading idea about how you measure the wealth of a nation because we, we, have equivalent, we have equated this to our gross domestic product. So we say, there is no purchasing power to people who don't have money, isn't it? To have purchasing power, it says you have money in your pocket. But how do you have money in your pocket if you cannot sell what you produce, if you cannot sell your education? You know, you get a job with education, then you have some purchasing power. You sell your onions in the marketplace, you have some purchasing power. Or you sell clothes. If you make clothes, you're a tailor, you sell clothes, you have purchasing power. But if a business, if you, if you make furniture, tables and chairs, you sell furniture to an institution like this, then you have purchasing power. What if all of us are buying things from elsewhere, and where do we expect to get the purchasing power without selling power? So what you should be talking about, even before we talk about financing, uh, what do you call it? Financing translation of medicine, of, of, of knowledge from university, we have to build the selling power itself, because what if we made those products and we're able to put them in the market, and the market has no selling power, then it means that our people cannot even afford those medicines. Yeah? So selling power becomes the point that helps us to get to attain development. And because our selling power is zero, except when you go to Sokomjinga, Sokomjinga becomes a place where everyone is struggling to sell their knowledge. So you can even have Sokomjinga of education where engineers are trained, but they cannot get jobs 
And at the same time, we go to China and get engineers to come and do the jobs that local engineers should do. And he called that Sokomjinga Yama Engineers. Because why would we do such a thing? Where doctors are trained, and the doctors cannot get jobs after they graduate because we have been to Cuba to get doctors to do the job. Sokomjinga Yama Daktari. Then what happens? All of us go on strike. We don't know whether engineers strike because I've never had a strike for engineers, but doctors, teachers, lecturers striking because we have created this philosophy of instead of figuring out the money itself, we think that money comes from somewhere else, the government. We create what's called collective bargaining agreement. What we are not familiar is that there's nothing to bargain for because the government doesn't have money. Money is created. <coughs> yeah. So our doctors have been going on since 20. 13, asking for money from the government. And as a matter of fact, the government doesn't have any money. There's nothing they can promise. And they can bargain all they want. There won't be money unless we get this science of money and how money is created to fund development. Yeah? So collective bargaining agreement, you only saw Jing up here <laughs> because there is no money coming out of it. So it's like taking tomatoes in a marketplace where no one wants to buy because nobody has money. The government does, doesn't have money. That is a fact of the matter. The governments never have money. Government waits wait for you to work, then you pay taxes, then it has money. If 80% of the people are unemployed, they're not working, so the government won't have people to tax, so it won't have money. Yeah? So we're in this vicious cycle that is developing, uh, you know, going around like this, and it's a vicious cycle of foolishness about money. And of course, that is because we haven't paid attention to the science of money itself to understand how it operates. What if, we ask ourselves, we went to every village and took a picture of whatever people are making there and put that picture on the internet, on a website, and with a description and a price. That is something you can do. What if we did that? And then we send those pictures all over the world, and then people order for those things. Then we can begin to have money. And let's create an internet, internet market, which does not have middlemen. I imagine that the middlemen are the ones going out there to buy potatoes from us from other countries. Internet market. Where, if I make furniture, I take a picture of my desk, you know, and then I describe nice desks that can be used at a university by a university dawn. You know, and then you say that this desk is made of hardwood from Mount Elg. Yeah? Nice description. And this desk is going to be sold for 15,000 shillings. You put the price there. Then we take those pictures and spread them to the entire world through the social media. It means that, one, the desk itself has left uh, Kakamega and it has gone to the world to show itself. So we have an international showroom. And so we call this... Sokojanja.com. And what if we come from Sokomjinga, we go to Soko, Sokojanja, yeah? Smart market where people in every village, because there's no village without a smartphone today, take pictures of whatever is there chickens, goats, uh, livestock, furniture, everything and we put them online. You see, online is a very deep space. You cannot finish the space on the internet. And so, if we put pictures for, for products in every family in Kenya, then at least people will buy from one another in the list. And we don't have to worry about the big supermarkets, as big supermarket owners sub, you know, distributing these things for us. So people, the distribution of things, we say decentralizing, we decentralize the market. We decentralize the market, which is centralized through brokers and middlemen who are all big owners of supermarkets. And those people are removed completely. And so people can just use their phones to put their products in the marketplace. And so we create Sokojanja. And this would help us to ensure that even if our guys in university discover something and commercialize it, there will be someone to buy because people have got the buying power. 
people get the buying power because they have a selling power. So this one ensures, ensures increased selling power. And of course, the economy just goes up. And then people have got the buying power because they have selling power. So there is no buying power without selling power. Let no one lie to you that you go to the market and buy a car without money, right? But if you're able to sell your eggs because they are online and then someone in another community can order those eggs, then you can accumulate the money to buy what? Uh, the car. The car is a product of research. Now, if we focus on the universal research and then we leave the community alone without increasing the community's selling power, we have not done anything. It's a big waste of time and money. And so basically, that's it. So the Eureka project then, I draw it here, becomes three things. <clears throat> There's this, the people themselves. How we engage the people to increase their selling power through Sokojanja. So Sokojanja, Ubri coin was ready on December 21 this year, last year, 2018. So what we are doing now is to distribute these two billion. Now we know that in order for a currency to become the standard currency for exchange of value in a nation, it has to be well known by the people and accepted. Kenya shilling is accepted because the government mandates that we use it for payments. What if we are not Kenyan government? We are just a bunch of people, say the scientists. Then <clears throat> we use the two billion to distribute, and we say if we distribute the two billion for free to at least a million people, then that money is going to become known in the nation and become the standard currency for exchange of value in the country. So that's what we are doing. And um, we have set aside 10 million, uh, no, 10,000 Ubri coin to give to people as part of the reason why he came to Kakamega County. And we are giving, let's say, this just giveaways. They're not, it's not money that is uh, being sold or anything. It's giving <coughs> away for free. And because we have created it for that specific job, it has to be distributed to the people. What people is, the act of giving itself the coins is the act of teaching someone how to use the coin. Because when I give you the coin, I have to show you how to get it on your phone. First of all, you have to download a wallet, a digital wallet that can house the coin. And so let's say giving is equal to educating and that is helping the coin gain uh, users. So when the coin get, gets users, then all these other things that we want to do with the coin will be easy to, you, to do because the coin already has got. So here's the program, the giving program. We give one 10,000. So see, this is Ubrika here, Ubrika. Gives 10,000 to one person. And then that person, we request that person to give 1,000 UBN to 10 people. 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. So the act of giving the coin helps that person to open a wallet, learn how to work with wallet, digital wallet, its security features, and how to transfer the coins from his wallet to other people. And when we give them the coins, if this person now, second generation, let's call this, this is generation one, we have given the generation one that money, and this gives it generation two. And if this person wants to give away, we top them up with another 9,000, so they have 10,000 to give away. So now, this G3 is also going to receive 1,000 from the person who received this. Now, if this person, gives away, say this person, this person, the, this one, the, the G1 here, gives away all the coins, we give him back another 20,000. This means that this person, for the work they have done, they're getting compensated with 10,000 coins because 10,000 has gone, give him 20,000, and then from this 20,000, he can repeat the procedure until he gets saturated. Now, who gets to be given the coins? Anyone, because the idea for this two billion is to make sure that the coin has reached the market. 
everywhere down to the village. Now, the giving itself, we say that give to all your friends, family, cousins, relatives, just give them away. And once you've given to those people, don't forget the people in your supply side. This is you here. These people you have given away, it's called relatives, families, friends, those people who depend on your dependents. Dependents, they are on your demand side of money. They demand money from you because you're working, you're the only one working. Then, most likely, you find only one person working in the entire family, and so many people are depending on them. Give all those people who depend on you coins. And those dependents, once they have coins, they, soon or later they're going to figure out how to use those coins for their own good. And you call these people the demand side people. They demand things from you. But much more important is the people on your supply side. These are people who supply your daily bread, okay? And if, for example, you are in construction, you go, you go and buy cement, you buy tiba, you buy windows, you buy glass, all that stuff. Those people supply you with things. And if they don't know about the coin, if you say educating, if they're not educated about it, you will not be able to go there and buy anything from them. So when you give the people on your supply side, then it makes sure that you're educating your suppliers. Now supposing, now this is a big one, if you own a petrol station, of course, and of course uh, you want to sell petrol to people. You cannot sell, these are people on the demand side of your petrol, make sure they all have the coin, but where you buy your petroleum from, from the dealers, make sure they have. Now in a place like this where there's a lot of farm produce, maybe if the farm produce goes to find market out there, those people who come and get your farm produce, you want to make sure that they have the coins. We give them away. But then of course, if, for every time you give, you get um, an extra, extra coins, such that if you give 10 iterations of 10 of 1,000, 10 iterations, like this, this one iteration cycle, let's call one cycle. You give 10 cycles like this, you can get free coins up to 100,000, uh, 100,000 coins. And we say that each one of these coins is about 50 shillings today. SH50, Bob. And what you're looking for in this distribution is what is known as Metcalf effect. Metcalf. Metcalf told us that the power or the, the value of a network is equals to, see, network's value. Hmm? Yeah. Value of network is equals to number of people in that network squared. See? So if we continue giving this generation and we get to hit a million people, the value of our network will be more than a trillion. It will be more than a trillion. That's, that's just how it is. So basically, uh, this is where we are with the project itself. And uh, we, we came from all the beginning, if I can summarize what we have just said, is that we came from understanding how money is, first of all, valuing projects. And you're talking about valuing projects for development, for example, at the university level. And we say how you convert that value into shares. And that how shares now are used to raise money on, in the long term. So raising money. Now to, to the problem that we want to solve here, which is life science and health. Or you'd say translation. Or translation and commercialization of university knowledge. Of university knowledge and three the problem in the market which is the market dislocation in Kenya and how we try to redress it by building Sokojanja and uh, to build Sokojanja to solve it in our discovery that we have problems in transferring money on Sokojanja and creating cryptos cryptocurrency to overcome this problem of checkout and then discovering that we have we can make cryptos that can actually finance the project besides the shares so we can you can do 
you can do a financing project project plus then the utility function of buying things on on on, uh, on the platform and then number five distributing a coin to achieve Metcalf effect of the crypto okay that's it thank you so much for listening i hope that this is helpful and maybe there are questions in the group yes mm -hmm. Is amazing. So my question is, mm. what made you to up to initiating that? What made you to start establishing Ubercoin instead of using already existing coins like Bitcoin uh, in the process of technology transfer? You could have, um, you could have convinced, convinced the public and the professionals on the relevance of your project and ask them to invest in it, maybe using bitcoins. So what prompted you to initiate Ubercoin? First of all, we don't have bitcoins. Mm -hmm. We don't have them. We'd have to go and buy the bitcoins ourselves mm -hmm. with money that we don't have. So, see, you don't have the money, you cannot buy the bitcoin. It's very expensive. Bitcoin, when it was created, was worth zero. Today, is worth 300,000 shillings for what bitcoin. So, well, we don't have the Bitcoin to, to tell the people that we're using. Yeah. Of course, uh, there are people who trade Bitcoins in Kenya, and you have people who are Bitcoin enthusiasts become educating people about Bitcoin. But it's become way too expensive to propose to use it. And of course, the other thing is that that was the problem when that Vitalik and his team found that we should allow other people, we should create a technology that enables other people, let's say enable other people to create technology like Bitcoin. Yeah? And because there's no limit to the number of projects that we have or we need to do in this planet. And I think that in the future, you're going to see cryptocurrencies created for very specific projects. Say, for example, you have a, your civil engineers, a group of civil engineers in Kenya, they can create cryptocurrencies for funding civil engineering work in Kenya. Yeah, and they won't say, why don't you go and use Ubricon? Because there's room for everyone. The civil engineers need money, a lot of it, to build, to build companies that, that the one that, that builds standard gauge railroads. So let's say we have, uh, uh, what, lawyers. We don't have effective legal system in the country because most lawyers are intimidated they, they, because they don't have money. What if they created legal cryptocurrencies that helps to provide law to the people? in a way that is good. So I also encourage you to think about that. There is, uh, because you can create, just like if you want to grow your food, you go and get the seeds and then you, you plant food. Every seed is going to produce a lot of produce. So, and that's the way it should be. Not one person keeping the money and the rest of us don't have access to it. So it's gonna be a bonanza of money. And of course, it's the best people who are working very hard on their projects, whose money will become valuable. Those people who create money and then they don't take care of it. It's like going and sowing seeds and then you don't come to look after it. Either it gets eaten off by the birds or um, there's no rain, you don't give it water, then the seeds perish. Yeah? We are too many to be confined to one currency in a nation. And of course that currency is not even helping us a whole lot. Yeah.